Not going to complain, but we do want our cold to come too, but just not for a while. My mic's not on? Well, it was. Let's check it out. Oh, it's blinking back and forth. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Well, good morning again. We'll try it again. A uh, couple, couple announcements. Um, Right after church today, well, first of all, if you're here for the first time, welcome. Or if you'd like to have a prayer request or a call from the office or the pastor, please fill out one of the cards that are in front of you, uh, the little white ones or yellow ones, and we'll respond to those just as quick as possible. But a couple of things going on this today. Right after church service, uh, we'll have a, a brief coffee fellowship, and then we will uh, start uh, setting up for the fair. So if we have any abled bodies that can help uh, set up the fair afterwards. Uh, we could really use your help. Uh, we do have Aaron that knows how to set everything up, so he's going to kind of run the setup part. <laughs> he's just finding this out, but that's okay. So anyways, that, that's right after church. Um, after the, again, a brief fellowship we'll have downstairs, and then we're going to start setting up, which means all the tables from the fellowship hall has to go down to the Sunday school room. The tables in the Sunday school room needs to be taken down, chairs need to be moved, and then we have a, a lot of stuff from the annex that has to come over. So hopefully, in the bulletin, it tells us that the reason will be meeting from 5 to 7. I'm hoping that the reason will actually be meeting at 1130 today to help us out. So, so if you hear this reason, people, uh, please, please uh, join us for this. And speaking of the fair, that's this Friday, uh, starting at 3 o'clock on Friday, and then again on Saturday at 8 a.m., um, and we, we could still use workers for that if you want to talk to Dory uh, to see if the, what position or what place she might need somebody at. And any men that would like to join us on Thursday night to put together some pies, uh, we could use help at uh, putting the pies together. We have enough turkeys around, uh, but putting them together, we could use a few men. And then, like I say, for the, for the actual fair itself, we could always use help. Uh, Allison wants to remind you that if you ordered uh, pie tickets already, and have not paid for them, she'll be in the office right afterwards. You're more than welcome to drop in there and uh, pay for the ones that you ordered. Or if you'd like to order some, uh, now's the time to do it. You can get your selection of either the 430 setting or the uh, 530 setting. <sighs> Busy days. And we are a blessed people. We are blessed in so many ways. And so today, as we honor the veterans of uh, this country... Uh, those within this church, I just ask you to take a moment of just re re reflecting on the blessings we have because of the men and women of our armed forces and the people of this country. So as the flags are posted, I ask that would you please rise as the flags are posted in today's sanctuary.
and the riches that we have through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the light of Christ is brought into today's sanctuary. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, Father, as we come before you on this beautiful day, we are humbled by the sacrifice that so many people gave to make us free in this country. We are also humbled, O oh Lord, for the sacrifice of what your son did for us, to make us free not just in, in this land that we live, but within our souls and within our hearts that we are free to be your people, O Lord. We are free to, to love as you have loved us. Almighty God, bless us on this very day. Bless the going on and the missions of this church. Bless the people of this church, O Lord. As we ask for blessings for all churches and all people around the world. Almighty God, you have given us abundance. And we need to show our our appreciation by our love for each other, thankfulness of the gifts we have received. Almighty God, we ask for prayers for Reverend Michael Glidden down in South Portland, O oh Lord, as this past, well, a couple of days ago, his mother passed away. Be with him and his family as he mourns. We pray for Doris Carpenter as... Uh, she is fighting cellulitis in her leg. Be with her as she heals. We pray for Julian Frost. Almighty God, as she's just an 11-year-old fighting Crohn's disease, in and out of the hospital for months. Almighty God, be with her, but be with her family as well as they await anxiously for healing. They wait anxiously for normalcy in, in her life. Father, be with them and guide them. Almighty God, we pray for this country. We pray for our president and all elected officials. We pray for this coming Tuesday in the elections that, that there is nothing but peace and unity that we can come together, even if we disagree, O oh Lord, but we can come together out of the blessings in which we have. O oh Lord, we pray for those that serve in the armed forces both in the past and today. We honor all veterans by, by being, uh, being here and by, by lifting them up, O oh Lord, in prayer and in action. 
Father, may their service not go unnoticed. May their love and sacrifice be part of our daily life. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that their hearts are opened to hear your word, to know your peace, to find your teachings and the hope that you have given them. We pray for all the families as well as there's times when there's separation caused because of their jobs. We pray this for all jobs. We pray this for, for our first responders who go out every day not knowing what they are going to face. The police and the fire departments responding to emergency situations. For all those working with the hospitals and nursing homes and, and with DHS, oh Lord, dealing with uh, situations that we can't even fathom at times. Lord, bring them peace. May their heart know you so no matter whatever situation it is, they will know the peace that you offer. Father, I pray that for each of us here today, that our hearts be open to know you better, to, to come to understand the peace that you can offer. We pray for our enemies in the same way, O oh Lord, that somehow we can come together, maybe not always agreeing, and, but working together to find a commonality. But Lord, it starts at home. It starts within our own hearts that we can hear you, O oh Lord, and our hearts can be changed. Father, at this time, we take a moment to lift up our own personal joys and concerns at this very time. Almighty God, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers for our sister churches and the different missions around the world. Be with those who are working with Operation Christmas Child as uh, they kick into high gear. And may we be reminded, O oh Lord, to bring in our boxes throughout the week. O oh Lord, bless us. Bless your people, O oh Lord. Bless those that will receive a lot of the food that came in today. May they know that it is given with love and hope that they too might know you and also have uh, their world change, that food won't be a scarcity in their life. Lord God, I pray for my grandson Paxson as he's home with a fever. Keep him safe and healthy. We pray for our choir director, Michaela, and Debbie, who's in our choir. Lord, may they healing happen and may they get back to us sooner than later. Father, I pray this for the world around us as we all go through our trials and tribulations. We lift up John, who will be facing surgery this coming week. Oh, Lord, be with him and his family. Lord, we thank you for those that volunteer in this church. I ask for blessings upon the upcoming fair on Friday and Saturday. May it be uh, a success in the fellowship that we offer, the goodness and the safety that is here within the confounds of this church and within our hearts. Lord, so many things to be joyful for as we come to a time of thanksgiving. May we rejoice and be glad in the blessings you have given us. May we rejoice and be glad in the trials and tribulations, the, the word that challenges our lives to see the change that needs to be made. Lord, I ask you to, for those that have their hearts open, to just penetrate us. And may we learn and, and become closer to you. Father, I thank you for the forgiveness that you offer as we stand before you and repent of our sinfulness. I thank you, O Lord, for your Son, Jesus Christ, that brings hope and a newness, a new birth to each, each of us each and every day. Lord, bless us. As we turn to your Son, remembering the words that he taught us to pray that says, Our Father,
please. the love of Jesus Christ. I have Dan up there laughing at my, my mic not quite going on all the time. But anyways, we, we are called to show the love of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we, we show our love for God and what he has blessed us with is to give back accordingly. To give back with a joyful heart, no matter how big the gift is, but to give in the abundance of the love that God has blessed us with. So as the deacons are are. We'll be here for the offertory as they come forward. Uh, please let us give with a generous and joyful heart.
Father, as we put these gifts upon your table, we ask that you uh, bless them and may they be multiplied to do your work here in this community and around the world. Father, we ask all these things. We ask everything in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. For helping us out as Michaela is under the weather and uh, she was here with us Wednesday night directing and then nice job today. Thank you. <laughs> so the scripture reading from today comes from the book of Luke and we've been again we've been following through the book of Luke for some time now and we'll continue with that up, up until Advent season. But the book of Luke it comes from the chap 20th chapter verses 27 through 38. But before we hear the word of the Lord, may we join together in a unison prayer that we say. Lord, upon the pages of this book is your story. It is also our story. Open our eyes that we may see, our ears that we can hear, our minds that we may understand, and our hearts that we may be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen indeed. So the word of the Lord from Luke 20, verses 27 through 38. 
some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man brothers dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died, died childless. The second and then the third married her. In the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry or be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but a living, but of the living, for to him all are alive. This is the word of the Lord for God's people. May we rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So this reading, um, many, we've heard it probably many times, but I want to try to get down to the, the meat and bones of what is happening here. And I think the first thing that we need to do, and many, many of you have heard about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Correct. So, so we know who they are, but do we really know the Sadducees? You know, we hear about them every once in a while. The Sadducees was a sect of Judaism, like the Pharisees, but they didn't really get along. The Sadducees were the elitists, the higher class. They were the chief priests and the high priests. Their territory, if you want to call it that, was in the political arena, but also in the temple. The, the Sadducees controlled the temple in Jerusalem, whereas the Pharisees would have been in all the synagogues. They were the priests of the synagogue. So one was very wealthy, and the Pharisees didn't, weren't hurting, but they were not the elitists like the Sadducees. And the Sadducees had power. See, for the ruling parts of the uh, Jewish sect, they'd be called a, a group called the Sanhedrin. So you'll hear about that a couple times in the Bible where the Sanhedrin Council would, would actually make a ruling. It was made up, by, I believe, of 70 people that sat on this council. And in this 70, most of them were Sadducees. They had the power. They had the political power. And they were more involved in the politics than they were in godliness in many ways. It's not that they didn't follow the rules of Moses. And in, as we read here today, that, that was their rule. They believed in the Torah. They believed in the five books of Moses and that Moses was the authority to their religion, their faith in God. That Moses held the power. For the most part, the, the Sadducees could care less about Jesus overall. They, they, they weren't really concerned about Jesus and his teachings until he started making waves and Rome began to take notice. Because, see, the Sadducees, again, with power, they dealt with Rome. They didn't want the apple cart tipped over. They wanted to keep it as it was because they were doing very, very well. But Rome started getting involved because of the teachings and the rumblings that they heard from the Pharisees, who, who called Jesus a traitor, basically. He, he couldn't even live, go into his own hometown. Right before this passage, we had the Sadducees, again, trying to trap Jesus, and you might remember the passage, about taxes. You know, who do we give? And Jesus, of course, says, what does your coin say? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God." So he kind of took that question and turned it around on them. Didn't do anything good. So we have the Sadducees once again looking to find fault in Jesus. And so this is the important part to hear this, this part of the question. Because it's not a question on heaven. 
It's a question to ridicule and mock someone who is thinking differently than them. In other words, they pose a question to Jesus that doesn't have an answer. It has an answer, but they, don't, they, they want it so they can mock heaven. That if you think about eternity, this does not make sense, this question. But Jesus uses the opportunity to go to where the Sadducees are at. And he answers them the question. Not always the one that they ask. He'll answer that as well. But then he kind of brings it into what they should really be talking about. Because if the Sadducees were really interested in God, they would ask a different question. Well, what they're doing here is they're saying, according to Moses, if you have a, a, you're married and your husband dies, the brother is responsible to be taking care of the wife. Now, the input, important part here is it wasn't as we think. I mean, some do, but... Overall, we do not think in today's world a wife to be property. It's just, it's, it's not in our thinking for the most part. But in that time period, women were nothing but property. And so basically what the Sadducees was asking Jesus, so this property that brother one owned and then got transferred to brother number two and then number three all the way up through seven, when they get to heaven, who does she belong to? It's not really who is married. That, that's not really. But Jesus is obliging the question. But really they're asking, who owns her? I think it's an uh, incredible, tough question to answer. Unless you know who the Sadducees are and what they're trying to point out. Again, remember, they don't believe in the resurrection. So this question has nothing to do with them. They weren't asking it so they could learn and grow from this. They were asking it to ridicule, to put down, to make Jesus look bad. It wasn't touching the subject of Jesus' teachings, but where they already knew everything. See, the Sadducees, like the Pharisees at times, had closed hearts, had closed minds, because they think they already knew. They already had all the information they needed. They already knew what Moses taught. And so this guy named Jesus cannot expound further and teach us any more that we know. So what they want to do is mock and ridicule someone who is thinking different than them. Now, as I read this passage and and stuff, I, I, I know that we have people still doing that in this world. Those with power or elitists, they, they want to put down someone who thinks differently than them. Even those with power and power, they want to put down. We, we have churches putting down another church because they think a little bit differently. And one of the first lessons that I think we need to hear in this passage is really, are you going out to learn more about who God is or to put somebody else down? Nowhere in the teachings of Jesus Christ do you hear him belittle or put someone else down to build the kingdom. He could have slammed the Sadducees at this point. But what he really does, and this is the beauty of this passage, he takes the passage and he goes to exactly where they're asking of him. They, they want to know. So, so who's, whose wife will she be? Who will own her? And Jesus tells them, in heaven, they're all children of God. They, there is no ownership. Now, I believe in the teachings of Jesus throughout, he would, he would like to say that even in this world today, you don't own them. They're my children. But that's for another story. Jesus didn't come to try to change people's minds in how they were living. He was trying to change this in how they thought. That God's kingdom is different. It's harder. They, they don't understand it because they already have their minds made up. They know everything. Have you ever gone to a doctor and you know what's wrong with you and so you tell the doctor, this is what I need, A, B, C, and D, and the doctor says, well, let me take a look. Well, you know what? It wasn't what you thought it was. It was just a simple ear infection. That was causing the problem. We can take care of that. Well, Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't want to hear any learnings overall. 
But that's exactly what Jesus does here. He is faced with the Sadducees who want to really, he, they, they concoct this wild scenario to make Jesus look bad. And so he answers the question. In heaven, there is no property. We're all God's children. I think that's the same message he has given us many times here in his teachings. But as Jesus does often, he takes that sacrifice, the, the, the question that really wasn't a question that for any learning possibility, and he turns it around. Just like he did with the tax question. He takes the Sadducees and he says to them, they are God's children since they are the children of the resurrection. Remember, Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection, but he says they're children of. And let me tell you why. Because Moses, now again, the very one that they hold all their laws and rules about, Moses himself said that showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That God is not the God of the dead, but he's for the living for all ages. See, he takes their very reason for holding their beliefs and gives them a different view. Now, see, for me, I call this planting a seed. You notice how Jesus doesn't get in an argument with them? He takes their question and answers that. And he also takes the question that they should have been asking, and he answers that for them too. And in the process of doing it, he is simply planting a seed. He is not taking his knowledge of being God himself, as the book of John tells us. He doesn't take this knowledge and beat him over the head with it. You know, oftentimes this is used as a weapon. Jesus never uses the word of God as a weapon. He always uses it as a seed. Something that can be planted and mature and grow. The mustard seed. He doesn't tell you what you must think. He will meet you to wherever you're at. See, that's what he's doing with this riddle that the Sadducees are coming up with. Because it's a riddle because there is no answer to it, really. And they're not really looking for an answer. They were looking for a trap to discredit Jesus Christ. And so Jesus takes their hero, Moses, and uses it to his advantage to plant a seed. And the very line that we didn't read after this passage, you'll hear the Pharisees basically say, ha, score one for Jesus. Now see, we have to remember that the Sadducees and the Pharisees are coming together for a reason. That's to put Jesus Christ to death. So the Pharisees aren't on Jesus' side. But they're coming together under a, a mutual agreement that Jesus is bad for the business. He's going to make things change. And we don't want change. So Luke again shows us Jesus' true mission in his disciples, in, in his living, in his life. And that is to spread the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To simply plant a seed in your heart. And then he'll give you all you need to dig deeper, to figure it out. He will tell you throughout the scripture that the first thing we all need to do to understand heaven or the kingdom even a little bit better is to repent. He tells us that, but we don't want to talk about that often. See, we sometimes think, well, we already know. And what I'm, what I'm saying in this passage is Jesus takes what they think they already know and turns it upside down. So just think about it. What is it in your life that you think you already know? What is it that, that you think you cannot do? It's too hard. It's, 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 it's bigger than what you think. And I can just hear Jesus turning that thought process upside down and saying, so who am I? Who am I to you? I'm bigger than anything you can ever fathom. I have turned people 
from deep, deep sinners, the ones that are going to be welcomed into the kingdom. See, this passage wasn't about marriage. It wasn't about, well, who will I be married? Because, again, I have that question a lot of times. If if a spouse dies and they get remarried, who are they going to be? That's not really the question. It was a question for the Sadducees to understand their hardening of their heart to really see who God is. And he says, we don't have to worry about heaven. Worry about what we're doing right now. So one of the biggest lessons that I got from this is how do I treat people that just want to be sarcastic in their question? How do I treat those who think they already know? How do I do that? And Jesus has given us the perfect example to meet the people where they're at. Instead of going on defensive and slamming them, saying, don't you know the word of the Lord? He simply speaks it to them as if planting a garden for the first time. See, I have a lot of growing to do. I know that. I have a lot of things that I need to get, take care of my life with other people. But it's not about telling them that they're wrong. It's about showing them the love of God and planting that seed. This is a beautiful, beautiful passage. It is reminding us that God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And this living and holy God is here right now with us through the Holy Spirit. He wants you to throw those questions at him, yes. But do it to grow, not to say how right you are. Throw these questions and these doubts at God to say, And then listen to God's response because he'll take you seriously. And I think he will answer your question. See, sometimes this table confuses people. We don't fully understand what this means. This table is not just the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the opportunity and the hope of every day. That with this nourishment, With God within us, all things are possible. It is Jesus Christ giving us the Holy Spirit. It is all the questions and answers right in this one table. See, whatever you need to bring before the Lord, do it. Open your heart. Ask for forgiveness. Because he will give you full and and complete forgiveness. And then, listen. Listen to the Lord. As he tells us, as he told his disciples, this is my body broken for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. If you've ever doubted that you can be forgiven, read the words again. Open your heart and hear Jesus saying it once again. You are forgiven. How powerful. You are forgiven. And God is more than ready to meet you where you're at at this very moment. And so we take and we eat of this bread and we drink of this juice and we hear the words of the Apostle Paul saying that every time we do this, we are proclaiming to the world that Christ will come again. What we are doing is what that first hymn was about. We're standing on the promises of God. So no matter how crazy Tuesday might become, no matter how crazy the world may seem, we're standing on the promises of God, on the resurrection of eternal hope and eternal life through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. So serving you today are our deacons of this church. 
and our elder, I believe, will be there, that as you receive this bread, I ask that you hold on to it, and we will take it as one family bonded together in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Please. This is the body of Christ. Brenda, this is the body of Christ. Mary, this is the body of Christ. And if you have any allergies, gluten-free, in the middle you'll see a little green cup. That is a gluten-free piece of bread, and you're more than welcome to to take that as our communion. If you would please serve the people. Sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone for evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written... It is mine to avenge mine, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. They are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord for the Lord's people. May we rejoice and be glad in it. Amen.
we hear Jesus say, take and eat. At some point of the supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. It is my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sin. Take ye and drink ye all of it. So, Allison, this is the cup of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your salvation and forgiveness. Again, serving to you in his holy name are our deacons and elders of this church. I ask that when you receive this cup, if so be, give thanks for the blessings that he has blessed you with. For his son, Jesus Christ, that went to the cross for each and every one of us. And then take, and you drink ye all of it. For it is your personal assurance that your sins have been forgiven. Every sin has been forgiven. So I invite the deacons of this church. And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongue or of symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and have all knowledge. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy and it does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil. hopes and hope love never fails but when there are prophecies they will cease where there are tongues they will be stilled where there is knowledge they will pass away for we know in part and we prophesize in part but when completeness comes what is in part disappears when I was a child I talked like a child and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. But then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. May the Lord add his blessings to the end understanding to these holy words. Amen.
Please be seated. Thank you, Mary. God, this is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. His blood shed for you and for all people for forgiveness of sin. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, Father, as we have come before you and we have been served by you of your body and your blood so we might come to know you, so we might grow, so we may have a new life, a new birth. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for the love that you share with us throughout your word, throughout the gospel. And Lord, may we share this love that you have given us so freely and in such abundance with the world around us. May we show who we are by the way we love others. In Christ's holy name, amen. And if you join me in our last hymn, hymn number 546, Sing the Wondrous Love of Jesus, or When We All Get to Heaven.
Amen. Can help us downstairs afterwards, please join us in Fellowship Hall.